Algebra, lesson 10. Any questions before we start about homework problems or any of the material we did last week? So the great accomplishment last week was the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So we can recall what is a prime number. is an integer p at least two whose only positive divisors are one and p, a composite number is an integer n greater than or equal to two, that is not prime. I.e. that is um, an integer n greater than or equal to two that has a divisor d such that d is strictly between one and n strictly greater than one and strictly less than n. And the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says that every positive integer is uniquely a product prime numbers. So for example, if you take n equal to 140, you can factor it into a product of primes 2 times 2 times 5 times seven, these are prime numbers. And we would write this as two squared times five times seven. Or um, or if you take the number I don't know, um, 21,000. And you try to factor it, well, it's hard just to look at the number and write down the factorization instantaneously, but this is clearly 21 times 1,000. And 21 is three times seven. And 1,000 is 10 cubed, so that's, two cubed times five cubed, or if you write the primes in increasing order, two to the power three, three to the first power, five cubed, seven to the first power. So, and there's no other way other than rearranging the primes. I mean, you can write this as three times seven or seven times three, but other than rearranging the primes, there's no other way to factor an integer into a product of primes. So that's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Uh, it is very, 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 very important. And in general, this is extremely important in commerce, in business. Uh, it is hard to factor a 
large integer. Into primes. And you might say, well, it's not that hard because if you have the computer program Maple, which I hope you do because you can get it for free from CUNY from, and just download it for free. In Maple, the command I factor N factors N if n is, let me just say, not too large. And not too large means, by normal human standards, pretty large. You know, you write down a 10 or 20 digit number, uh, Maple will factor it. But if you write down a number with 1,000 digits or 10,000 digits, and these are the ones that are used commercially, whatever that means. Um, Maple won't factor it. But this is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Uh, every number is a product of primes. And what is the standard notation for a factorization? You can write n as, suppose we let script p be the set of prime numbers, two, three, five, seven, 11, and so forth. This is the set of primes. We proved last time Euclid's theorem that the number of primes is infinite. And the standard way to write N as a product of primes, this capital Greek letter pi stands for product, just the way the capital Greek letter sigma stands for sum. The sum over all the primes, p to the power, and the notation for the power is v. So v sub p of n means the power to which you raise the p in the prime factorization of n. Um, so for example, where we had n equal to 1400, let's see, when I factored it, what did I get? Uh, oh, sorry, n equal to um, 140. So we factored 140 into 2 times 5 times 7 times another 2. I think this is right. Um, so in terms of this notation, this is two to the power two, three, there's no three here. That's like three to the power zero, five to the power one, seven to the power one. What about the other primes? Well, every other prime is raised to the power zero. So in this, and when we use this standard notation, this is officially a product over the, all the primes, but V sub P of N is zero for all sufficiently large primes P. That is, there are only a finite number of primes that actually divide this number. So what is V sub two of 140? That's the power you raise two, two in the factorization, that's two. V sub three of 140 is zero. Right? The power of three that divides 140 is, is the zeroth power, which is one. V sub five of 140 and V sub seven of 140, they're both one. And V sub uh, P of 140 is in fact zero for all primes greater than seven. So for all sufficiently large primes. Any questions about this? Can you repeat the last part? 
uh, this part, which is the last part, the uh, factorization of 140. Yes. Well, 140, and you factor it, it's two squared times five times seven, which is, but if you look at this, so if you ask the question, for a given prime p, what power of p divides 140? All right. V sub p of n. is the, so n's a positive integer, v sub p of n is the power of p, the highest power of p that divides n. So what is v2 of 140? Well, here's 140 factored The, high, the power of two, the highest power of two that divides 140 is two to the second power. What's the power of three that divides 140? Well, you don't see any three here, do you? Three doesn't divide 140, but of course three to the zero is one. So three to the power zero divides 140 because one divides every number. So to say that the power of three that divides 140 is zero is the same as saying three does not divide 140. What's the power of five that divides 140? It's the first power and so on. So here, do this right now where you're sitting factor 3,960 3, into primes. And compute this number V sub P of 3,960 for all primes P. So, if you were in elementary school and they gave you this problem, you would just do it. And because you're in college, it seems harder, I think. So spend a minute and tell me what the answer is. Sometimes when you do this in you know, school before college, they call these uh, factor trees. Um, you build a factor tree. Um, so what is the factorization? Can someone tell me? This is the way a lot of kids learn to do this in school. You have 3,960. You can certainly factor that as 10 times 396. And of course you can factor 10 as two times five. And 396, that's divisible by three. Divide three into this, you get 132. Of course, 132 is even. That's equal to two times, um, see how many times does two go into 132? Um, 66. 66. 66 is certainly six times 11. Six is two times three. And all these numbers at the bottom of these paths through this tree, they're all primes. 
So you can't factor them anymore. So 3,960 is two times five times three times two times two times three times 11, right? Two, five, three, two, two, three, 11. Let's see, I have three twos. I have two threes. I have one five. I have one 11. And any other power divides this to the zeroth power, like seven to the zero and 13 to the zero and so forth. So for the number 3,960, the power of two that divides 3,960 is three. The power of three that divides 3,960 is two. The power of five, oops, how did I get five? Uh, yeah, that's right. Sorry, three, 3,960. The power of five that divides 3,960 is the first power. The power of 11 that divides 3,960 is one, is also the first power. And V sub P of 3,960 is zero for all P different from two, three, five, and 11. That is for the infinite number of primes, for all primes ex with, except for these, these four, the power of P that divides the number N is zero. Any questions about this? Because this is really just like elementary school, but in a more sophisticated language. And the function V sub P of N is called the um, piatic value of n. Okay. That's just the name of this function. For every prime p, v sub p of n gives you the piatic value of n. It just means the highest power of p that divides n. Any other questions about this? Um, I mean, you really should spend time at home factoring integers. It's an important skill in algebra and something you need to do. I mean, you know, take all the numbers from 200 to 300 and factor them. It's not a bad problem. Okay. So there's one more important topic in arithmetic and number theory that is foundational in algebra, because it's a model for a lot of what we do in algebra. And that is the subject of congruences. So the fundamental relation is the following. Let M be an integer. Let's say it's positive, not important, but the M be a positive integer. So here is the definition. Integers A and B 
are congruent modulo m. So this is the expression we're defining congruent modulo m. If m divides the difference a minus b. And the notation for this is a three bar lines equivalent to b and in parentheses mod m. So this expression means m divides a minus b. So for example, um, 14 is congruent to um, 35 mod seven, because if I look at the difference, 14 minus 35, that's minus 21, that's minus three times seven. So seven divides this difference and 14 is congruent to 35 mod seven. Fourteen is also congruent to thirty six mod two because fourteen minus thirty six is minus twenty two, which is minus eleven times two. Two divides the difference. If A and B are not congruent modulo M, so we write A is not congruent to B mod M if M does not divide the difference A minus B. So once you fix the number M, M is called the modulus. Once you fix the number M, any two integers either are or are not congruent modulo M. Okay. Any questions about this? This is a very important definition. So what are some properties of congruence? So this is a theorem. The relation of congruence modulo M is an equivalent relation, equivalence relation. An equivalence relation is a relation that is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So let's just check that those properties are satisfied. First, that it's reflexive. For every integer a, a minus a is zero. That's right. Zero is zero times m. So m divides a minus a. So a is congruent to a mod m. Every number is congruent to itself. Every element is related to itself with respect to this relation of congruence modulo M. So congruence is reflective. Let's prove that it's symmetric. If A is congruent to B mod M, then M divides A minus B which means a minus b is m times some integer q. 
So you multiply by minus one, b minus a, which is minus a minus b, is minus mq, which is m times the integer minus q. So m also divides b minus a, so b is congruent to a mod m. So if a is congruent to b mod m, b is congruent to a mod m. That's symmetry. And finally, the third requirement for a relation to be an equivalence relation is that it's transitive. So suppose A is congruent to B mod M and B is congruent to C mod M. What we have to show is that A is congruent to C mod M. But A congruent to B mod M means A minus B is some multiple of M. M divides A minus B. And B congruent to C mod M means B minus C is also a multiple of M. M times say some Q prime. And if you add these equations, the B's cancel you get a minus c is mq plus mq prime, which is m times q plus q prime. So a minus c is also a multiple of m. So a is congruent to c mod m. So this relation of congruence mod M is an equivalence relation. Okay. Again, this is all in the notes that are uploaded on Blackboard. So it's all written out legibly. And it's also in the little book that I suggested you buy uh, on algebra. Another important fact about congruence is, is <coughs> every integer is congruent modulo m to exactly one element, one number in the set of non-negative integers from zero up to m minus one. And the proof is as follows. Take any integer a, by the division algorithm. That just means by long division, if you take A and divide it by M, you get a quotient Q and a remainder R, where R is strictly less than M and greater than or equal to zero. And for integers, strictly less than M means at most M minus one. So A minus R, is mq, just rearranging this equation, which means a is congruent to r mod m, m divides this difference, and r is an integer between zero and m minus one. So this is a proof of half of the theorem. This says that every integer mod M is congruent to one element in this set, to some element in the set. And of course I claim that it's congruent to one and only one. So for the proof of that, 
suppose R and R prime are two elements in the set of non-negative integers up to M minus one, and your number A is congruent to R mod M, and A is also congruent to R prime mod M. So by the symmetry of this relation, if A is congruent to R, then R is congruent to A mod M. And by transitivity, <coughs> if R is congruent to A and A is congruent to R prime, R is congruent to R prime mod M which means M divides the difference, R minus R prime. But, and this is the big but in this, zero and R prime are both, R and R prime are both between zero and M minus one. So the difference between them, R minus R prime and absolute value is at most M minus one. So if M divides R minus R prime, then either R minus R prime is zero or in absolute value, R minus R prime is at least M. But this condition can't hold because R minus R prime is less than or equal to M minus one. So exclude that. So R, min R minus R prime is zero or R equals R prime. So this is a complete proof of the fact that every integer is congruent to exactly one of the numbers in the set from zero up to M minus one. And and what is called the least non-negative residue of A, an integer modulo M is the unique element R between zero and M minus one such that A is congruent to R mod M. Now, whenever you have an equivalence relation, you have an equivalence class. So, The equivalence class of an integer A modulo M is the set of all integers, let's say A prime, such that A prime is congruent to A mod M. That is, all A prime equal to A plus MQ for some integer Q. That means A, A plus M, a plus 2m, a plus 3m, and so forth. But you can also have negative values of q, a minus m, a minus 2m, a minus 3m, and so forth. And 
this, um, you might say it's a doubly infinite arithmetic progression. An arithmetic progression is what you have when you take a number A and you add all multiples of M to it. And here we're subtracting all multiples as well. So it's doubly infinite is called, so the name of this is the congruence class of A modulo M. We know that every integer is congruent to a unique number between zero and M minus one. So a complete set of representatives of the congruence classes modulo M is the set zero, one, two, three, up to M minus one. <coughs> Now, the standard notation, which we've seen before, is suppose we let mz be the set of all multiples of z. Sorry, the set of all multiples of m. This is also, of course, this is. the congruence class of zero. In fact, let's define A plus MZ to be all the numbers in MZ with A added to them. So it's A, A plus or minus M, A plus or minus 2M, A plus or minus 3M and so on forever. This is really notation. So I should just say the set a plus mz is the congruence class of A modulo m. And this is some partition of the integers. We have, for example, if m is equal to five, so, uh, we have the congruence class zero plus five Z, one plus five Z, two plus five Z, three plus five Z, and four plus five Z. We've partitioned the integers into equivalence classes with respect to this relation. So we divided the integers into five sets. Each set is a congruence class each set is an infinite set. So we've divided the integers into five pairwise disjoint infinite subsets. In general, let Z mod MZ, this is our notation. Let Z mod MZ be the set of congruence classes modulo M. And the way we read this, Z mod MZ. This is, we're saying this in words out loud, we say Z mod MZ, that's what that means. So for example, Z mod 5Z consists of five sets, zero plus 5Z, one plus 5Z, two plus 5Z, three plus 5Z. 
and four plus five zero. Those are the congruence classes, modulo five. Maybe the simplest case is when you take the modulus m equal to two. In this case, the set of least non-negative residues You go from zero up to M minus one, but M minus one is one. So it's just zero and one. So Z, so the congruence class of zero modulo two is the set of all N, set of all A, that A is congruent to zero mod two. This means the set of all A such that A minus zero is divisible by two. This is forget, this is all A such that two divides A, that's just the even integers. So the congruence class of zero modulo two is the even integers. What is the congruence class of one? Modulo two. It's all A such that A is congruent to one mod two. That's all A such that A minus one is divisible by two. Two times Q for some Q. That's all A which you can write as two Q plus one. This is just the odd integers. So the congruence class of one which we write as one plus two Z is just the odds. And if we take the integers and we divide it up into the congruence class of two and the congruence class of one, this is just the even numbers and this is just the odd numbers. So again, this is just like what you learned in elementary school. Every number is either even or odd. Huh? Every number is even or odd. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, can you repeat, uh, how did you get the residuals zero and one? Well, so, let me go back. I proved this theorem. Every integer is congruent modulo M to exactly one element in the set of non-negative numbers from zero up to M minus one. So if M is equal to two, M minus one is one, and this is just the set zero and one. So every integer is congruent modulo two to either zero or one. Right. Take any number, divide by two, the remainder is zero and one, and the number is congruent to its remainder. So every number is congruent to either zero or one mod two. So if you want to begin to understand congruences, maybe the first thing is just to think about the even and the odd numbers. The even numbers are all the numbers congruent to zero mod two. The odd numbers are all the numbers congruent to one mod two. 
and every number is even or odd. That's all. Thank you, Professor. Just to make sure you can do the calculation right now, find the least non negative residue of, I don't know, 97. Well, I wrote 37. 137 modulo 7. And of 137 modulo 11. And of 6,985 modulo 23. So spend a minute and do this calculation and maybe I'll just use this opportunity to take attendance today. Yali Bilazuni, Angela Alba, Ariani Espinal, Bubakar Tapsoba, Brian Alberto, Daniel Santiago, Dorabel Duran, Edward Hernandez, and Edwin Hernandez. That's just Forch. Everest, Pacayago. Galio Dabre, Diaz Sturgis, Jessica Campos, Jonathan Campos, Jose Kings. Catherine Cruz, Leon Rodriguez, Yang Sar, Manolit Gonzalez, Nicola Clark. Neil Dar, Marina Soto, Richard Benitez, Travis Headley, Vanessa Yu. Nasser, oh. 
Okay. Good. So what are the answers? What is 137 congruent to mod seven? You get the least non-negative residue just by long division. Seven into 137, one, 67, nine, nine sevens are 63, four. So 137 is congruent to four mod seven. This is the least non-negative residue. What's 137 mod 11? Well, I get a remainder of five. So 137 is congruent to five mod 11. What's 6985 mod 23? Maybe four. No, that's right. Three. Fifteen take away nine is six. Six now, remainder of sixteen. So six thousand nine hundred eighty-five is congruent to sixteen modulo twenty-three. <clears throat> it's just elementary school arithmetic. Any questions about this? Now, it turns out we can defi define addition and multiplication of congruences. So suppose for, this is always for a fixed modulus M. So suppose A1 is congruent to B1 mod M and A2 is congruent to B2 mod M then you can add the congruences. A1 plus A2 is congruent to B1 plus B2 mod M. And you can multiply the congruences. A1 times A2 is congruent to B1 times B2 mod M. Okay. Let's just look at an example. We have, um, 29 is congruent to eight mod seven minus three is congruent to 11 mod seven. So here the modulus is seven. Why are these true by the way? 29 minus eight is 21 is seven times three minus three minus 11 is minus 14 is seven times minus two. 
So we have this congruence. Suppose I add, what would I get? 29 minus three is 26. Eight plus 11 is 19. 26 minus 19 is seven, which is seven times one. So 26 is congruent to 19 mod seven. Suppose I multiply 29 times three is minus 87. 11 times eight is 88. Minus 87 minus 88 is minus 175, I think. No. Um, Let's see, if I divide this by seven, I get two, 14, 35, seven. This is seven times 25. So the product is also correct, right? So this is just an example of what this theorem says. The theorem says you can add congruences and you can multiply congruences. And here's just an example that demonstrate this true fact. Okay, but a theorem, a theorem needs a proof. So proof, if A1 is congruent to B1 mod M, that means A1 minus B1 is M times some number I'll call it Q1. And if A2 is congruent to B2 mod M, that means that A2 minus B2 is a multiple of M, M times some Q2. Suppose I add these equations. A1 minus B1 plus A2 minus B2 is MQ1 plus MQ2. If I factor out the M, it's M times Q1 plus Q2. If I rearrange this, this is the same as A1 plus A2 minus B1 minus B2 or minus B1 plus B2. That's equal to M times Q1 plus Q2, which means A1 plus A2 is congruent to B1 plus B2 mod M. So this is the little proof that you can add congruences. What about multiplication? So we had that A1 is B1 plus MQ1 and A2 is B2 plus MQ2. So multiply A1 times A2 is B1 plus MQ1 times B2 plus MQ2. That's B1, B2 plus B1, MQ2. Plus MQ1 times B2 plus MQ1, MQ2. That's B1, B2 plus, and I can factor an M out from each of these three terms. M times B1, Q2 plus B2, Q1 plus M, Q1, Q2. 
So A1, A2 is congruent to B1, B2 mod M because the difference is divisible by M. So that's a proof that you can add congruences, at least two of them, but in fact, you can show by induction, if you have AI congruent to BI mod M for let's say K different congruences, then the sum of the A's is congruent to the sum of the B's mod M and the product of the A's is congruent to the product of the B's mod M. So now we actually have, well, let's see, sorry. Um, so consider the congruence classes A plus MZ and B plus MZ. So for every A1, let me put it this way, so A1 is in A plus MZ if and only if A1 is congruent to A mod M. This is the, con this is the congruence class or the equivalence class of A mod M. And B1 is in the congruence class B plus MZ if and only if B1 is congruent to B mod M. Now, by what we just proved, A1 plus B1 is congruent to A plus B mod M. So I want to define addition not of congruences, but of congruence classes. as follows, if you take the congruence class of A and the congruence class of B, we define the addition, the sum to be the congruence class of A plus B. And the question is, is this well defined? So we showed, for example, that the congruence class of 29 mod seven is the same as the congruence class of eight mod seven because 29 is congruent to eight mod seven. And the congruence class of three mod seven is the same as the congruence class of 11 mod seven. Because minus three is congruent to 11 mod seven.
No. If we take 29 plus 7z and we add it to the class minus 3 plus 7z, by this definition, this is A, this is B. This is 29 minus 3 or 26 plus 7z. If we take 8 plus 7z and 11 plus 7z, and we add these two classes, we get 19 plus 7z. But these two classes are the same, and these two classes are the same, so these have to be the same. And in fact, they are because of what we just proved. If 29 is congruent to minus 3 and 8 is congruent to 11, then 26 is congruent to 17 mod 7. So these are two representatives of the congruence class. So this addition is well defined. And with this addition, we have the following fundamental fact. The set of congruence classes Z mod MZ is a finite abelian group under addition. Proof. Well, first of all, Z mod MZ is just the set of these M congruence classes. So this has size or cardinality. Cardinality is just another name in mathematics for size. As size M, so it's finite, it's a finite set. Maybe a finite set of infinite sets, but it's a finite set. Addition is well-defined. What can we say about addition? So if I, addition is first of all, associative. If I have A plus MZ, B plus MZ, and C plus MZ, if I add the first two congruence classes and then add C plus MZ to the sum, this is A plus B plus MZ plus C plus MZ. When I add these congruence classes, I get A plus B plus C plus MZ. But this is an integer. And for integers, we know we have associativity. This is A plus B plus C plus MZ, which is A plus MZ plus B plus B plus MZ, which is A plus MZ plus the sum of B plus MZ plus C plus MZ. So this is a proof that addition of congruence classes is associative. What's the additive identity? I claim it's the congruence class of zero, which we just abbreviate as MZ. So let me, let me write out using this notation. So for any A, A plus MZ plus zero plus MZ is A plus zero plus MZ is A plus MZ. 
and zero plus mz plus a plus mz is zero plus a plus mz, which is a plus mz. So this is the additive identity. You add mz to any congruence class and you just get back the same congruence class. What is the additive inverse? Well, if you take the class of a plus mz, a is an integer, positive, negative, zero, it doesn't matter. There's also the congruence class minus a plus mz. If I add them, I get a plus minus a plus mz, which is zero plus mz. Sorry, uh, yeah, zero plus mz. And similarly in the other direction, minus a plus mz plus a plus mz is minus a plus a plus mz, which is zero plus mz. So the inverse, the additive inverse of a plus mz is minus a plus mz. And finally, for all integers a and b, a plus mz plus b plus mz is a plus b plus mz. But for integers, a plus b is the same as b plus a. And that's b plus mz plus a plus mz. So therefore addition is commutative. And therefore z mod mz is an additive abelian or commutative, they mean the same thing for groups, additive abelian groups. So for example, if you take m equal five, look at the congruence classes of z mod five z. Suppose we just write, let's see, uh, a bar to be the congruence class of a mod five. So z mod five z consists of five congruence classes the congruence class of zero, one, two, three, and four. And what is the addition table in this group? Well, zero is the identity. So zero plus anything is zero and anything plus zero is the anything. So that's filled in those lines. When you add one to one, you get two. When you add one to two, you get three and so forth. When you add one to four, you get five, which is the same as zero. When we add two to these numbers, we get two, three, four, five, which is the same as zero and six, which is the same as one. When we add three going across, we get three, four, five, which is zero, six, which is one, and seven, which is two mod five. And when we add four, we get four, five, which is zero, six, which is one, seven, which is two, and, and uh, eight, which is three. So this is the addition table for congruence classes modulo five. Now, the integers form an abelian group, an infinite abelian group. The integers mod five, z mod five z is a finite abelian group. And all we're using here is addition, but you know, we can also multiply integers. And so the integers are not just an additive abelian group, 
So Z is an additive abelian group with also a second binary operation of multiplication. And what is called a ring in algebra is a set like the integers, which we, where you can add and you can also multiply the elements. So let me define this. A ring is a set with two binary operations. addition and multiplication such that the following properties are satisfied. Let's say R zero is, I call the set R. R is first of all, an abelian group, finite or infinite, under addition. Second, properties of multiplication. Multiplication is associative. There is a multiplicative identity that's called one. And you have the distributive law. So I'm not saying that under multiplication, every element has a multiplicative inverse. That is not a requirement to be a ring. But multiplication is associative and is also the multiplicative identity. And we have what we, the way we describe it is multiplication distributes over addition. What this means is if you take any elements A, B, and C, A times B plus C is A, B plus A, C. And anything that satisfies these properties is a ring. So one example is Z, the integers, with the usual addition and multiplication. Another example is the set of all two by two matrices with, in this case, real coordinates. Because you can add and subtract matrices and you have an additive abelian group. You can multiply matrices. The identity element is the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 1 and the distributive law holds. So here are two examples of rings. Actually, the rational numbers, the real numbers, the complex numbers with the usual addition and multiplication are rings. Now there's some additional properties a ring might have. So, the ring R is commutative if multiplication is commutative. A times B is B times A for all B, A, B in the ring. So a commutative ring is a ring where multiplication is commutative. Now, if the ring is commutative, a commutative, so like Z is commutative. Um, a commutative ring is called an integral domain. 
if it has the following property, the only time a product of two numbers is zero is if one or the other or both factors is zero. So an integral domain has this property or equivalently, the range in integral domain, if um, whenever AC equals BC um, and C is not zero, you can cancel A equals B. So Z is an integral domain. And a commutative ring is a field if every non-zero element, call it F for field, if every non-zero element A in F has a multiplicative inverse. So Z is an integral domain but not a field. So for example, the element two has no inverse in Z. The rational numbers, the real numbers, the complex numbers are fields. So for example, two has the inverse element one over two. One over two is a rational real and a complex number. It's just just not an integer. And so Z is a commutative ring. And in fact, Z mod MZ is also a commutative ring. So all M. So how do we prove this? Well, the first condition we already proved MZ mod MZ is an abelian group. What about the associativity of multiplication? So I take A plus MZ times B plus MZ, and I multiply that by C plus MZ, it's the product of three congruence classes. This is AB plus MZ times C plus MZ. This is AB times C plus MZ. But for integers, AB times C is the same as A times BC. These are the same integers. This is A plus MZ times BC plus MZ. And this is A plus MZ times the product B plus MC, C plus MZ. So multiplication in Z mod MZ is associative. What is the identity? I claim the congruence class one plus MZ is the multiplicative identity. Because if I multiply that by A plus MZ, that's one times A plus MZ, which is A plus MZ. And if I multiply in the opposite order, A times one is the same as A. So one plus MZ is the multiplicative identity. What about the distributive law? If I take A plus MZ 
times the sum of the congruence classes B plus MZ plus C plus MZ. That's the same as, let me do it on the other side so I have more room. So if I have A plus MZ multiplied into the product of B plus MC plus Z plus MZ, that's A plus MZ times B plus C plus MZ, that's the sum. When I multiply, I get A times B plus C plus MZ which this integer is the same as AB plus AC plus MZ. So that's AB plus MZ plus AC plus MZ, which is A plus MZ times B plus MZ plus A plus MZ times C plus MZ. So that's the distributive law. If I use the notation A bar to be A plus MZ, what I just proved is that A bar times B bar plus C bar is A bar B bar plus A bar C bar. That's the distributive law. So multiplication distributes over addition in Z mod MZ. So Z mod MZ is a ring. And finally, if I multiply two congruence classes, that's AB plus MZ, but for integers, AB is the same as BA. So this is B plus MZ times A plus MZ. So multiplication is commutative and Z mod MZ is a commutative ring. So this is a really interesting result, starting with the integers and you choose a modulus M and you look at the congruence classes mod M, there's an addition and a multiplication defined for congruence classes. And with respect to these operations, Z mod MZ, the set of congruence classes modulo M is a commutative ring. That's pretty important. So what we did today really is um, introducing congruent, the, the relation of congruence, proving it's an equivalence relation. We call the, the equivalence classes congruence classes. And we look at the set of those congruence classes and it turns out they form an abelian group and even more than that, they form a commutative ring. So that's really kind of important. Um, any questions about this? This is, uh, no, yes. Okay, well, all right. Well, that's a lot. So we will stop for the day. Uh, be back on Wednesday. Bye all. Thank you, Professor. Sure.